So I am uh, with TED Conferences, TED Talks. Um, I work on the video engineering team. Uh, several of my colleagues are here. Um, I also uh, teach computer science at Loyola part-time, um, and I'm based out of New Orleans. Um, so what are we talking about here? We're talking about uh, a library that we've, we're building um, that wraps FFmpeg. Uh, why do we want to do that? Well, FFmpeg is pretty cumbersome. Um, so if you look at this uh, command, if, if you're new to it, if you're new to FFmpeg, uh, explaining what this does uh, is actually rather difficult. Uh, it's something that uh, is sort of tough to grok at, at first view. Um, so on our team, we also, we get asked to do a lot of different things, often ad hoc. So we get asked to concatenate videos together or to generate test video or hard burn subtitles into things or you know, a variety of things like that. Um, and so we need something that we can do that's flexible enough uh, to be able to fit into our automated system, but also uh, not have to write raw FFmpeg command line every time. Um, so, um, so we looked at a bunch of existing FFmpeg libraries. This started about a year ago uh, that we started looking at this. Um, and what we found, uh, and we looked at Node and other languages as well, what we found is that a lot of the libraries out there uh, either have very expansive uh, APIs that map individual options in FFmpeg to uh, functions on the API, um, or they have uh, sort of a limited specific uh, focus, and so then they have limited flexibility to support plugin functionality or um, the, the kinds of things that we might want to do. They're often very targeted projects, um, and so they have sort of a low usage that's focused on that specific target use case, uh, and they don't support a lot of else outside that use case. And also, you know, personally coming to it from, a, as a new person to the video engineering space, um, we really wanted something that would let us express how we think about the pipelines that we're building uh, in the code that we're writing um, and sort of express the, the conceptual structure of what we're building in FFmpeg uh, in the code. So let's look a little bit deeper. So this is fluent FFmpeg in Node. Um, this is code out of some of our prior uh, encoding automation. Um, so, if we use, for example, the input options or the output options, uh, those let us just write any FFmpeg input option uh, in as arguments and make use of that. Um, but if we want to use anything outside of that, we now have an extra layer of translation that we have to add. So, if you're familiar with FFmpeg, um, you now have to learn a new set of function names uh, to be able to use this library. And if you're not familiar with FFmpeg and you learn the library, then if you want to look at anything, uh, any of the details of what FFmpeg is doing in the FFmpeg documentation, you have to translate back to the FFmpeg options to get there. So it actually adds a little bit of cognitive load um, on top of FFmpeg, what FFmpeg is already doing to be able to do this. Um, and it, it doesn't actually help you understand what it's doing because it's this one long piece of code with chained, uh, chained functions here. Um, doesn't really express uh, what's happening in this uh, pipeline here. So what do we really want out of the code? Well, what we were looking for is can we write code that's readable? Can we use composable objects that we can understand and reason about? So, for example, Nick uh, mentioned, uh, put up a slide with this uh, thing where you have to extract planes and then you have to run this super resolution and then you have to merge the planes back. You know, it'd be nice if we had a library, that in a library of objects and we can just import it and then use it and we don't have to worry about writing that every time. Um, can we still reference the FFmpeg documentation for the options we want to use? Um, can we create reusable collections? So this is the idea of a library, right? 
And then uh, can we understand at a glance, just looking at the code, what the workflow we're building is actually doing? So how do we get there? Well, I think the first question we started to ask is like, well, what makes an FFmpeg command? What are the pieces? So we start with kind of the, the first thing you find on the FFmpeg homepage. There's an input file, there's an output file, right? Um, so the first thing we have, we've got the input file, we've got the output file, but there's actually a couple more things going on here that are not really expressed in the command, right? So there are a few automatically defined options that FFmpeg is doing for us based on the extension of the file, you know, and where we started. Um, so it's, it's inspecting the file for us and the input file for us and defining these options. There's also an automatic mapping of the streams from the input file into the output file. So we don't really see that uh, in the FFmpeg command. So these are some things that maybe we have to think about. Um, so what might the code look like? Well, ideally we would have, uh, we would create an input object and we would create an output object and then we create a command and we'd add the input, add the output, and then we can execute the command, right? So this is kind of what we would like to see uh, for this example. It's fairly simple. So what about real life, right? This is a really simple example. What happens if we get uh, to a more general case? Well, in a more general case, um, we might have some global options, so the FFmpeg uh, command line accepts global options, so we have to think about those. Um, from there, we can have multiple input files, right? We may be merging a few things together or concatenating them or overlaying them in some way. Uh, we might have some filters in the pipeline, so we can have filter graph. And we might have uh, more than one output file, each with its own options. And then we have some mappings, and some of those mappings might actually go through our filter graph, right? So this is a little bit more complicated of a picture, but this is a little bit more complete of a picture of what might be happening in one of our, uh, one of our commands that we do. And so what we'd like is for the code that we write to be able to express this picture for whatever we're doing. So let's walk through an example. So let's take that command that we saw before that's kind of hard to explain to somebody. Um, and let's take it apart. So this is just rearranged. It's all the same stuff. It's rearranged and it's labeled. And now I'm going to make it a little bit easier to tell apart by putting colors on it. And now let's actually see if we can draw the picture of what's going on here. So that's what this picture looks like, right? We have one global option. We have an input, two input files uh, with different options on them. Uh, we have a filter graph, and we have an output file with a bunch of options on it. So we'd like to write some code for that. So we built a library that does this. Uh, library is called Fessonia. It's open source. We would, this is early. It's a version one. We're using it now in our encoding automation. Uh, but we would love for you to try it out and, and help us build it. Um, so what does it look like? How do we get there? Uh, so in Fessonia, we've got five basic objects in the API that help you model this stuff. Um, there's a command. This is kind of the command wrapper. This is where everything gets added. Uh, we have an input object. This represents the input file with its options. We have an output that represents the output file with its options. We have a filter chain. So this is kind of the basic object. Filter chains get added to a, a filter graph. But each command has its own filter graph. So you just add chains to the filter graph, uh, and then you map the inputs and outputs of those chains. Um, and then we have filter nodes, and those are the individual uh, filters that go into the filter chain. 
So if you wanted to import these things in Node, you can uh, do something like this. Um, we do accept config options. Uh, these are like if you wanted to give us a specific location of your FFmpeg installation, you can do that. Uh, normally, we just look on the path. So if it's on the path, it'll work. Um, there are some internal classes, so if you want to come help us build it, you may have to deal with those classes. Otherwise, you don't really have to worry about them. So let's construct this FFmpeg command sort of bit by bit uh, using the library. So we start with filters. Uh, why do we start with the filters? Well, because we have this idea that these filters might come out of a, uh, a library of things that are sort of frequently used that we just import, right? So we can sometimes assume that the filters are already built for us and we'll import them. So we'll start there. Um, so what we see here is we have this filter chain. Uh, so we start with a scale filter and then we go into a subtitles filter. Um, the scale filter maps to the scale filter object that we're building here. And the uh, subtitles filter maps to this object that we're calling screener warning. And so this is, I think, the first indication of, of how we can make things more readable, right? What this pipeline is actually doing is not adding subtitles to the video. It's adding a warning to the video that says this is... Uh, this is not for public content, please do not share, right? And so we know that that's what it's doing because we've named it appropriately. We've named it screener warning, right? So from there, uh, we construct a filter chain. And so now we have a filters object that we can work with in the rest of our code. Then uh, we'll go ahead and create the inputs. Um, so now we're at the point where we might start if we had imported the filters uh, and, and now we're starting to construct our code. Um, so we create a video input here. Um, it has a seek on the, on the beginning. Uh, we're using the same option names as are in the FFmpeg uh, documentation. And this is intentional. This is so that you can go to the FFmpeg documentation and read the documentation and use whatever you find there directly in the library, right? Um, the other thing that I'll note is the second uh, input that we have is actually the same file. So in the prior, uh, in the prior view, right, with just the FFmpeg command, we don't know what the intention is for that input until the end where we see where everything's been mapped together. Here we can actually name it appropriately so that we know what the intention is from the start. The intention for the first one is that it's the video input, and the intention for the second one is that it's a delayed audio, right? So we're gonna pull the audio stream out of this, and we're delaying it so that we can sync things appropriately, right? So from there we'll create an output. Um, this is just uh, adding the output file name and then adding all of the appropriate options. Notice that here we don't include mappings, so the map options, and we don't include the filters. Right? Remember we said the command has a filter graph, and we're going to add the filters to the command's filter graph. Um, so this is a little bit of a different way to ha of handling things. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. So from there, now we can actually start to construct a command. So here we have, we create a command, we put the command level global options on the command. We add the input for the video. We add the input for the delayed audio. We add uh, the stream specifier for the video input into the filters, right? These are video filters. Um, and then we add that filter, that set of filters to the command, right? And that implicitly adds it to the command's filter graph. Then we add streams to the output, right? So we add the first output stream of the filters, and we add the audio output stream of the delayed audio, and then we add that output to the command. And so now we've constructed a full complete uh, command. 
So let's, let's see what we've created when we do this. Um, what we get out of it is something that looks a lot like what we had before. Now you'll notice that we create the uh, output pad names for the explicit output pad names for the filters. Uh, we do that for ease of mapping, right? So uh, this subtitles filter, we may have more than one. We append a, a hash at the end just to make sure that we have unique uh, identifiers for the different subtitles filters we have. Um, and then it's, uh, it's suffixed with the stream number there. Um, we can also review the command style view of it. This is what actually gets executed in Node, so it hits the array format uh, output. And then from there, uh, when we execute this, we'll probably want to monitor progress of the encode. Usually we're encoding things that are pretty big. They take a little while. Uh, for that, we do output some events. So the main fmbag command object is an event emitter. It will, event, it will emit update events throughout the process. And if there are er errors, it will emit an error event with the error object. Um, and then when it finishes, if it's a failure, you'll get a failure event. Uh, if it's a success, you'll get a success event uh, with the exit code and, and the data appropriately. Um, you'll notice here that I'm calling command spawn. Uh, so we, we have two options for executing. You can execute with the execute method, which gives you back a promise for the output of the command. Or you can execute with the spawn, which actually gives you back the child process that's running. Um, so if you want to interact with the child process, you can. So here's that prior example in Fluent FFmpeg. Um, for comparison, here's what that now looks like in Fasonia. And you can see that this is a lot easier to follow and a lot more readable here. We can see what we're doing with the filters. We can see the two inputs that we've created. We can see the output that we created. And down here, we can see all of the stuff that we've done with uh, constructing the command and putting it together. So uh, this is the library. Uh, big thanks to my team. Uh, Mark and Joe are here. George is not, but thanks to George as well. Um, and we would love for you to go try it out. You know, we're, we're using it for our use cases, but our use cases are not all the use cases. So uh, please go try it out. Um, do some things with it. If you find bugs, uh, please let us know. Uh, if you find things that are missing, let us know. Um, or submit a pull request. We'd love to have you help out. So thank you.